All right, I want to talk a bit about Moses because Moses is very important to American law because uh, the United States operates on three premises. One, Roman government. Our government is Roman in style. Our philosophy is Greek and our laws are Jewish. And so Moses is very important uh, to the laws of America, the Mosaic law. So let's look at Moses because um, it's a very interesting um, history about the real story of Moses, the lawgiver. We know that Moses was given the law by God. He's the lawgiver and the leader of the children of Israel. And supposedly God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And he comes down from Mount Sinai, bringing to the children of Israel the new law. The whole, the actually the Ten Commandments also, of which Moses is supposed to have gotten from God. The Ten Commandments are actually based on the the Egyptian negative confessions. Do some research at the library or on the web on the subject of Egyptian negative confessions. And you'll find that the Egyptian negative confessions was uh, the laws in Egypt and they are almost identical to the Ten Commandments. So that's probably where we get the Ten Commandments is from Egypt. And here's just a, a classic example of the comparing the Egyptian negative confessions to the Hebrew uh, laws from Moses. So the Mosaic Law. Moses the lawgiver. All right, we have Moses the lawgiver in the legislative chambers of all across America and all the states and the federal government. We have statues of Moses uh, being the lawgiver. Not you know, not even mentioning, of course, the Vatican and all over the world. Moses is respected as the great lawgiver. Uh, Supreme Court. You see Moses holding the two laws. The tablets. Inter interesting too is that Moses, when first given the the law from God, he on the tablets he um, threw them down and broke the tablets. So he was the first lawbreaker. This is where we get the idea that you break the law. As I said, here's Moses, the lawgiver, depicted in the U.S. House of Representatives. Why does Moses have horns? Now, I have some interesting questions about Moses. Let's start with his horns. A lot of people don't know that Moses was always pictured with horns. Uh, this is in the Vatican. In churches, you will always see Moses. Anytime he's uh, portrayed, you'll see him with horns. Uh, Moses is pictured with the moon or lunar horns. Moses was the focal figure of an ancient cult of moon worship on the Sinai Peninsula. The horns represent the crescent moon. The moon in this lower quarter resembles uh, horns. As this encyclopedia talks about, the lunar phase when the horns of the crescent moon point up at the angle. So the horns are actually the moon in the lower quarter. And we will see the, the god of the moon. His name was Sin. We'll get to him in just a moment. <coughs> You'll see the goddess is wearing uh, the moon. The moon horns. Um, Native Americans, of course. Native American uh, chiefs wore horns. Uh, this is why they would count their days. Native Americans uh, would count their days from sundown to sundown. That's why they would always keep track of their days by many moons. They would not say many suns, but by many moons. So the horns of the Native American Indian chiefs were the lunar horns of many moons. And, of course, the Vikings kept the, the same identical idea. The Vikings had the moon 
horns. And it was, as I said, the lower quarter of the moon <coughs> was uh, in the shape of horns. And so, establishing that the lower quarter of the moon, of the horns, now we get into the actual archaeological findings. We see the moon being pictured on coins. Here's hands raised, worshipping the moon. These are ancient, uh, ancient findings in archaeology. Here's the, the moon on its boat as it floats through the sky in the ancient Egyptian idea. Here's the uh, Virgo the Virgin, the constellation of Virgo, connected to the lower quarter of the moon. The moon god above the, uh, the three in the middle. So, the lower quarter of the moon has taken on the, the appearance of horns. And here you'll see the same thing in the Vatican. The Vatican, lower quarter of the moon. The moon cults. I'm not going to bother to read all of this because you can read it yourself. But it basically is talking about an ancient cult of the moon. And, of course, in Islam, uh, Allah is connected to the moon cult. Now, if you go to the Google, for instance, if you go to Google and type in moon god sin, because the actual name of the old Arabian moon god, was his name was Sin, S-I-N. Sin was the Semitic moon god's name. So as I said, if you go to Google and just type in moon god, Sin, S-I-N. You'll see there's over one million entries just on that one subject. Then if you put into uh, Google, say, S-I-N, equals Allah, you'll get about uh, 1,270,000 entries talking about the moon god Allah. And here's another one. Um, this one's like three and a quarter million if you put in moon god Allah. So Allah, or Sin, S-I-N, was a moon god in ancient Arabia. Here's another one. If you put in Islamic moon god, you get 198,000 entries. Uh, here at the Catholic Church is, even uses the crescent moon. As I said, the moon god's name was Sin. Sin, the moon god, was a god chiefly venerated in the pre-Christian civilization in southern Arabia. It is significant. Uh, the lower part of this paragraph, it says, It is significant that the Semites of the great cavern, caravan city of Pyramara in the first three centuries of the Christian era also gave high priority to the worship of the moon. And there again we see that the moon god's name is Sin. Now, one dictionary, or actually it's an encyclopedia on symbols, talks about the moon god's sin. It says, if Moses climbed Mount Sinai to meet the resident god, then the god he met would have been the moon god Sin, who had been enthroned on that mountain since the rise of Sumeria, and gave his name to it. In fact, Sin gave his name to the whole Sin I Sin Ai Peninsula, formerly the land of Sinem. So originally Yahweh was not only a form of the primitive lunar deity of Arabia. So Yahweh, the god of the ancient Hebrews, is actually the old god of the mountain, Sin, the moon god. says, in Babylon, homage was paid above all to the moon god, the supreme guarantor, guarantor of cosmic order. So we see this, uh, here's another one, another cuneiform picture from the ancient Sumerian showing the god Sin receives the homage of two of his worshippers. You'll see the moon in the lower quarter, and that's the moon god Sin. And as I said in Mount... Uh, in the ancient Arabian, 
a system of moon worship, a mountain was AI. So you take the mountain AI and connect it to the god Sin, it becomes Sin AI, or Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is simply the moon god Sin and his mountain, which is spelled AI. Worship of the moon god. So, we see that originally Yahweh, the last sentences in yellow, says the original Yahweh was only another form of this primitive lunar deity of Arabia. So that's why today... In America, we spell synagogue uh, S-Y-N, but originally the correct spelling is S-I-N, not S-Y-N. That's why if you go to Israel and going to a, a Jewish synagogue, it's spelled S-I-N, because it's the worship of the moon god, Sin, the house of the god Sin. Here's a, here's a synagogue in Israel. Zoom in on it, spell S-I-N, not S-Y-N. So you'll find all over the world, except in America, all over the world, synagogues that spell S-I-N in honor of the God that they're worshiping, the moon god, Sin. Here's an article, Traces of Worship of the Moon God, Sin, Among the Early Israelites. So we see that in the Jewish tradition, it's always uh, used the symbolism of the moon, um, even on their sacred, sacred or blessed uh, symbols, amulets, you will see the worship, raise, their hands raised, worshiping the moon. So the phases of the moon were very important in the ancient Phoenician, Canaanite, Hebrew uh, tradition. Here you see the priest lighting a fire to the signal for the new moon. Moon worship was very important in the ancient Israel and the ancient Hebrew. Even during the Middle Ages, uh, we see the Jewish cycle of the moon being celebrated. Lots and lots of material and pictures on the worship by the Hebrews of the moon god Sin. Above you'll see um, a carving, blessing of the new moon. So in Sinai, as I said, was a large and very high mountain range in the, midst of, in the middle of Sinai. And from the east, you could look east and you would see the moon coming up and uh, over that mountains. And so the ancient peoples believed that the moon lived in the mountain. And the moon god's name was Sin and the mountain was spelled A-I. Put the two together and it becomes Mount Sinai. So that's who Moses would have been um, going up to see when he went up into the mountain to get the, the law. He would have been going up to see the moon god, Sin. As a matter of fact, it's called Sin Ai or Sinai. So, the moon god, Sin. <clears throat> that's the first part of um, the real story of Moses. Moses was the leader of the lunar cult, worshippers of the moon god Sin. A mountain in the ancient language was Ai, put the two together, and it becomes Mount Sinai. Uh, go back to Google again and just put Moses, the moon deity, and you'll find us 318,000 entries talking about Moses and Mount Sinai. Moses and, moon, Moses and moon worship. Uh, Sinai moon worship. Moses and the volcano god. No. Moses and the volcano god. Now, we've seen Moses connected to moon worship. The moon god Sin, AI. Now we're looking at Moses. Another feature of Moses uh, that a lot of people don't know anything about. And that is Moses was also connected to volcano worship. So we have the moon, and now we have volcanoes. Volcanoes themselves, <clears throat> volcanoes themselves were very powerful symbols in the ancient world. They still frighten people today. 
on the volcano in this particular uh, encyclopedia of symbols says like any other impressive and fearful aspect of nature volcanoes have been the object of worship for human beings from the earliest stone age so volcanoes have always been symbols of worship <clears throat> and again yet the original Yahweh seems to have begun as a volcano god also Mount Sinai, where Moses encountered him, was the seat of the Midianite god, who had formerly dwelt in a volcano. So, we are seeing that Moses, when he encounters uh, Yahweh on Mount Sinai, <coughs> along with being a moon god, uh, we also see that Moses was involved in volcano worship. And even books today talking about Mount Sinai show mountains on fire. Only time you see a mountain on fire is a volcano. Even one book is called The Mountain of Fire. Moses took stones. Here we, here we have a picture of Moses <clears throat> with the stone tablets. And that looks to me to be a volcano behind him. Does it look like a volcano to you? This is from Hebrew and Jewish uh, books for children, Bible pictures, Moses in front of a volcano. Here we have Mount Sinai, Jehovah performs signs for the Hebrews. Does that look like a volcano to you? There's another one with the children of Israel camped at Mount Sinai, <clears throat> where Jehovah or Yahweh was the volcano god. There's another picture of the volcano and eruption. <clears throat> and uh, so we got plenty of pictures of this throughout uh, religious literature. You'll always see Moses in a volcano. So look, does that look like a volcano to you? Here's one Hebrew telling another one to look at the volcano. Volcanoes, of course, had lightning associated with them. Israel and Mount Sinai dedicated itself to Jehovah. So here are the Hebrews worshiping um, the volcano god that Moses was going up to see. Here's Moses up in the volcano. Uh, here's another picture of the children of Israel running away from God because he was scaring them. Of course, I would be scared too if you were that close to a volcano. So we have pictures, like I said, we have many, many pictures of Moses uh, in connection with the volcano worship. Uh, here's another one. Jehovah led the sons of Israel to the mountain named Sinai. Does that look like a volcano to you? So we know that Moses and the story of Moses also dealt with volcano worship. That is history. We also know that Moses had uh, other sides to him, too. Now, here in the Jewish Encyclopedia, the symbols for the different holy days. And in the lower right hand, the lower right hand you will see uh, the Feast of the Giving of the Law. So here we have the Feast of the Giving of the Law, which also coincides with the uh, first fruits. And does that appear to be a volcano to you? Looks like a volcano to me, and it also has lightning, as you will see, has lightning all around it. And of course, like I said, that's typical because the lightning does accompany volcanoes. Now, this is taken from a, um, a Hebrew reference work on the symbols of the holy days. And here is a symbol for the feast of the giving of the law to Moses. That appears to be, to me, a volcano with lightning strikes all around it. The word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan, or Vulcanus. It's derived from an old Cretan deity named Vulcanus. Here's Vulcanus of Vulcan, the volcano god, holding in his hands the lightning and the hammer of Thor. So with the hammer and the lightning bolts, uh, the old ancient volcano god Vulcan frightened the whole world. He was the god of the mountain. 
Prometheus was also a volcano god whose worshippers took him to Greece, while Yahweh, the Hebrew god, was also a volcano god whose worshippers took him to Judah. So Prometheus, Yahweh, um, all of these were ancient gods of the volcano. Tribes living on the slopes of the full fallout area of an active volcano promoted the smoking home to the status of a tribal goddess and regularly threw their captive enemies into the lava filled lava of the in the hope of dissuading her from erupting over them. One such volcano in Anatolia was Mount Yahweh, whose worshippers were the Jews. Uh, we find that Mount Yahweh was changed to Mount Yahweh. Uh, his worshippers took the volcano god with them when they invaded Babylonians and drove them out of Anatolia and into Phoenicia. So, again, uh, just to reiterate, yet the original Yahweh, the ancient Hebrew god Yahweh, seems to have begun as a volcano god. Here we have God, Yahweh, on the fiery mountain with lightning all around, uh, chiseling out the Ten Commandments for Moses. And this is God with his hammer, and you'll see the mountains on fire with lightning, just like uh, Volcanus or Vulcan, the volcano God. One and the same thing. So Moses was going up to a volcano uh, to get the law. So we're talking about the law of the volcano god Vulcan. He was also identified with the local moon god Sin, as we said before, the moon god worship, uh, after whom the mountain was named. But then in Exodus 13, it says the appearance of Yahweh was as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So in the book of Exodus, uh, we are told that Yahweh always appeared to his people, Israel, as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so here it is in the book of Exodus, <clears throat> we read, and the Lord went before them, Israel, by day in a pillar of cloud. This is from the Bible in the book of Exodus. To lead them the way. And, a, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light. To go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So the pillar of cloud by day, obviously a volcano. Pillar of cloud by day is a volcano. Pillar of fire by night is a volcano. So we read that uh, in other reference works in the Bible, it says the magnificence of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain. And the people said, we heard his orders from the middle of the flames. So, right down to the Babylonian captivity, Yahweh remained primarily a volcano god. And in Psalms it says, I called upon Yahweh and cried out to my Allah, and heard my voice in his temple, and the land shook and trembled. So we see that uh, Moses was uh, dealing with, when he went up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, the uh, volcano god Vulcan. And here are just some uh, scriptures showing the same thing. How the noise thereof from God showed concerning the cattle also concerned concerning the, uh, the vapor. The noise thereof telleth uh, we feel his presence in the thunder. There's all kinds of scriptures in the uh, Old Testament talking about um, they heard like on 37.2 uh, hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound goeth out of his mouth. Um, the bottom, number four, it says and after it a voice roared he thundered with his voice of his excellence. Uh, God thunders 
marvelously with his voice. So I'm just showing that there are many different scriptures that talk about God speaking to his people in thunder. God thunders marvelously with his voice. And here again uh, in Job 37, it says the storm, the clouds, God's tent, gathered as the thunder or the voice of Yahweh roars. They descend and God shoots the arrows of his lightning, his lightning or thunderbolts. God thunders wonderfully with his voice. All of these references in the Bible are talking about the God of the mountains, Mount Sinai, was also a volcano God who thunders wonderfully with his voice. So the voice of God is thunder. And of course, we know Zeus was always pictured with lightning bolts, <clears throat> and that's the way Yahweh was pictured. So, <clears throat> interesting that God in the English transliteration of the Latin word Deus, Deus is an alternate spelling of the Greek word Zeus. So when you use the word God in the English, it comes from a Latin word Deus. Just understand, God comes from the Latin word Deus, and Deus is an alternate spelling of the Greek god Zeus. Deus, Zeus. God is Zeus, the god of thunder and lightning. From all kinds of reference work, you can see that our word God comes from Zeus. <coughs> So there is Zeus with the thunderbolts. Here again is another Bible reference work saying, Thunder is called Kulath, of voices, for it is considered the voice of God. So when the ancient people saw lightning and thunder on a mountain, it was uh, burning with fire, they were frightened because God was talking to them. Actually, no, it was just a volcano. Moses and the volcano god Vulcan. And, of course, that's what you get with a volcano is a lot of lightning and thunder. And I can see why it would have frightened people. Lightning can be symbolized by means of an arrow. So, so much for Moses and the volcano god Vulcan. Oh, and one more point about Moses and the Vulcan, the volcano god. Vulcan, the volcano god, <clears throat> There's a symbol in the ancient Hebrew that's still used today. Mr. Spock, as you will recall, here we have Vulcan. Mr. Spock is a Vulcan. And that hand symbol is used in Hebrew uh, religion today. It's a very interesting symbol. And why would uh, Mr. Spock be using a Hebrew uh, symbol and calling himself a Vulcan because this is a Vulcan symbol. Here we have, just very quickly go through this, you will see this symbol used in Hebrew literature everywhere. It's called the benediction symbol, the blessing symbol. So the rabbis will bless the congregation after the service uh, with this hand sign. Here's a Pentateuch scroll crown with the hands raised in the priestly blessing. Here we see the Lord is high, and he, yet he looks upon the lowly. And you'll see the Hebrew priest giving the blessing. Here in a uh, synagogue in downtown Los Angeles, you will see the, um, the prophet giving the blessing in the Hebrew hand sign. Uh, here's a good picture of a rabbi, and the service is closed with the blessing or the benediction symbol. The same symbol that Mr. Spock, the Vulcan, uses. Because Hebrew religion is also based on the worship of the old volcano god at Sinai, Sin Ai, the moon god, the volcano god, the Vulcan. But where does this hand sign come from? It comes from the split hoof of a goat. The split hoof of a goat 
is also connected in the most ancient world with Hinduism and with the worship of Vulcan, uh, the volcano god. The split hoof of a goat is used uh, in the Hebrew religion. That's where it comes from. All of this is very, very uh, involved, but I'm just giving you the basic concepts for which you can go and do your own research on where these symbols and words have come from. The goat god. We also have the worship of the goat god, Baphomet. And here is an interesting point, too, is that the goat god or Vulcan, the goat god is being uh, worshipped here, as you can see. Even in the Bible, it has the man riding the goat, which is a familiar Masonic symbol, too. Here on, in the uh, tarot cards, we see that the devil is representing as giving the, uh, as the devil giving the, uh, the symbol, the hand sign of the goat god. So, we've looked at Moses as the leader of the ancient lunar or moon cult of Sinai, again, the god of the moon, his name was Sin, and a mountain was Ai. Put him together, you become Mount Sinai, the moon god. The home of the lunar moon god, but is also Mount Sinai was connected, as we saw, to volcano worship also. Next we saw Moses as the leader of the ancient volcano cult. Then we saw the volcano god son Vulcan, still with us today on TV. Let's examine another side of Moses before we leave him. Moses and mushrooms. Moses, we're told in the book of, of uh, Genesis and in the Pentateuch, led the children of Israel uh, out into the wilderness. And they were fed each day with something called manna, manna from heaven. We have pictures of the Hebrews collecting manna from heaven. And the manna from heaven they would pick up in the morning. We're told that manna is actually, the word manna in Hebrew means, what is it? It's because obviously the children of Israel didn't know what it was. But the Bible reference work says whatever it was, it was small, round, flaky, as white, and obviously it came from heaven. So the manna from heaven, the word manna meant what is it? And whatever it was, it was small, round, flaky, and white. Here they are picking the manna from heaven off the ground. And we're told that the children of Israel would eat the manna. Here it is even in Exodus 16. And the account in the Bible says, And when the dew that lay on the ground was gone up, Behold, upon the face of the wilderness there was a, lay a small round thing, small as hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, It is manna, for they did not know what it was. And so Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And across in the reference work it says, It is manna, simply meaning, What is it? Well, they knew not what it was. Well, it's very simple. What manna from heaven actually was, was small round things picked up in the morning dew. We have many, many pictures of this uh, taking place. Small round things being picked up in the morning dew. Even in the ancient and medieval world, they showed Jews picking them small round things in the morning dew. What would that be if it wasn't? Mana from heaven was, in fact, a small round thing, mushrooms. When the dew that lay on the ground was gone up, well, that's when mushrooms usually form on the ground, a small round things in the morning dew. So, what we're talking about here is mushrooms. 
has a bunch of mushrooms. This is the Amanita Moscara, a very famous mushroom, hallucinogenic mushroom. Uh, Andre Paharek in his book, The Sacred Mushroom, The Door, Key to the Door of Eternity, The Search for the Secret Plant of the Ancients, used to send the mind to another world and into the future. Here we see even in the ancient Egyptians, you will see uh, the gods, and in India also, the gods using uh, the mushroom. Soma, the divine mushroom of immortality. The word Soma simply means the history of magic mushroom is known the world over. Again, it was called the food of the gods. We have many, many books talking about the magic mushroom in relation to the ancient Hebrew and the ancient uh, Christian congregations. The mystery of the mana. Mana was the mushrooms. The small round things in the morning dew. Many, many books, many reference works on this subject of the plant of the gods, the food of the gods. Uh, here's some articles written in Israel. There's quite a few articles that have been written in papers and magazines in, the, in Israel talking about Moses actually uh, on psychedelic drugs and leading the, uh, the people uh, to those sacred mushrooms. This is from a newspaper article. Hebrew University researcher says Moses was tripping at Mount Sinai, showing that uh, even in Israel they're publishing articles about uh, when you start doing your research and really looking into what, what the story of Moses is all about, it's about a moon cult, it's about a volcano cult, it's about hallucinogenic mushrooms. There's another one talking about Moses. So, Moses was not the only one on mushrooms, though. Adam and Eve, uh, being the first two, a uh, couple beat him to it. Even as far back as the uh, in the Bible in Genesis 1, talks about Adam and Eve. Well, here Adam and Eve is pictured in a church in France with the uh, the tree of knowledge being mushroom, a big mushrooms. Christian fresco showing Amanita Mascara as a tree of good and evil in the Garden of uh, Eden. So a lot of people do not know that uh, all around Europe and in the Middle East, um, Adam and Eve are pictured uh, getting their wisdom and knowledge from the tree of good and evil, which is actually a mushroom. Here it is in a church, Adam and Eve with the mushrooms. All kinds of pictures on this, but this kind of uh, this kind of knowledge is not given to Christians or Jews. But if you want to do some homework, you'll find that uh, Moses was, and the story of the manna from heaven goes back to the sacred mushroom. Here's pictures of Adam and Eve taking uh, pieces of the mushroom from the snake in the Garden of Eden. And there you'll see the Amanita Muscara mushroom as a backdrop to Adam and Eve. These, these pictures are replete throughout uh, the ancient world and in the European churches, religious institutions. All of these people know that the mushroom was part of uh, the story. And there you'll see uh, mushrooms in the middle. And here's uh, Jesus on one side and there's some of his followers on mushrooms. Here's God giving mushrooms. Well, that was in the ancient Old Testament times. So all of this mushroom uh, use was in the Old Testament. But what about today, modern day? Let's look at the Christian church today. <clears throat> there are books like the Holy Mushroom, Evidence of Mushrooms in Judeo-Christianity. Uh, John Allegro, one of the three top men in the um, 
deciphering of the Dead Sea Scrolls. John Allegro wrote a book called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross was a study of the nature and origins of Christianity within the fertility cults of the ancient Near East. Fertility cults? Yep. Fertility cults. And here, uh, here's some beautiful Middle Ages paintings of Jesus. And here you'll see Jesus presiding over mushrooms. Uh, giving his followers mushrooms. And it says um, in Matthew 26, 26 in the Bible, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Interesting that the word body, take and eat, this is my body, Jesus said. The word body, here it is again in the King James Version. Matthew 26, 26 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Well, the point being is that the word body uh, is a word soma, and soma means mushroom. So in a Bible dictionary, look at the word soma, and it will say it's body, which means a mushroom. So here we have Jesus feeding his apostles mushrooms. Here's uh, in the Middle Ages, in the medieval church, you'll see the mushroom uh, around the saint. Here's a mushroom table, the Amanita Muscara table of mushrooms. Modern day paintings of Jesus dying in a mushroom. Christmas is Jesus' birthday, so naturally the symbol of the mushroom will match. So all over the world in Christmas, and especially in Russia, the mushroom is used as a symbol in Christmas. Santa Claus on the mushroom. Mushroom symbols. Always the red with the white polka dot, uh, which is Almanita Muscara for Christmas. It's uh, quite literally everywhere, but most people don't see these things. They're not looking for them. But mushroom use by the uh, early Christians uh, was replete all over the world, and the ancient history testifies to it. So, so much for the mushrooms of Christmas. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year with a Amanita Muscara mushroom. So in conclusion, we see that Moses leading his people, the children of Israel, uh, fed them with manna from heaven. The manna from heaven that they were picking from the ground every morning was a mushroom. With this knowledge, we can see the logic of the headdress of the ancient Hebrew priest. In the ancient world, the priest, different priests, not only Hebrews, wore mushroom headdresses. Here, the Jewish priest with the mushroom cap to symbolize the importance of the magic hallucinogenic mushroom in their rituals. Mushroom headdresses for Jewish high priests uh, are in the Middle East, kings, potentates, and high priests always had mushroom headdresses. So, so much for, um, that looks like a mushroom upside down on that priest head. Here's mushroom worshippers for Jesus. And here's a mushroom head. He looks like he's been on it for some time, too. Look at these goofballs with their mushroom headdress, and they're so profoundly ignorant, they have no idea in the world what they're wearing. They're wearing mushrooms on their head. So that should tell you something about their philosophy of life. And, of course, typical of the world we live in, people will go and kiss the ring of the mushroom head. 
thinking it's something holy. Here's a bunch of mushrooms. Here's another bunch of mushrooms. Mushroom worship in the Christian church today is replete everywhere. There's a bunch of mushroom heads there. So time to say goodbye to all the mushroom heads. Yeah, that's right. Even the uh, cooks and chefs were the mushroom symbol for the food of the gods. Here's the high priest with his mushroom cap. The Bible is filled with mushroom worship. So, so much for the law of Moses. I guess that's it. So now you know a little bit more about Moses, the moon-worshipping uh, prophet of the moon god Sin, or leading his people to worship the um, volcano god Vulcan, and feeding his people with mushrooms. So, so much for the law.